get us started. Um, and so thank you so much for uh, your uh, praying. And um, tonight we're talking about keys to discovering your true self. And um, uh, this is a famous, uh, this image here is a famous painting. It's one of the most famous paintings uh, ever painted by mankind. Uh, the painter, artist behind this is um, Michelangelo Bonarati. Michelangelo Bonarati is the, uh, we don't usually hear his, you know, you know you great when you can just use one one name. In this case, um, uh, Michelangelo, everybody knows who you're talking about. And uh, this is actually a fresco. A fresco is a painting that is typically on a wall or on a ceiling in this case. And uh, it took him uh, a period of years to, in this, uh, in Rome, this chapel that is a part of the, uh, uh, that is a part of the um, um, Vatican. Uh, it took him, actually, that's not a part of the Vatican. Was that part of the Vatican? I don't think so. Was that part of the Vatican? I don't even remember now. I think it is, I think it was a part of the Vatican. Uh, and it was one of the chapels. Yeah, I think it was. It was part of the Vatican because I remember the crowds now. And um, so he had to be on his back for several years. I, I can't remember how long. Painting on his back so that he could paint the ceiling of this beautiful chapel. And um, Pastor Chris and I, during our sabbatical, had the opportunity to visit this place uh, in early February, and I was just uh, riveted by the sight of this. I had read and studied. I've studied humanities and art over the years, and uh, I was just overwhelmed by the beauty and by the uh, brilliance of Michelangelo in this painting. And this is the actual painting um, uh, here up close and um in some ways, uh, the Sistine Chapel is not as big as you might imagine. It's not huge. But then in other ways, it is uh, it is quite spacious and uh, very crowded. And you're not supposed to take pictures. Of course, people still did. <laughs> you're not supposed to take pictures. There's guards around, uh, temple guards, uh, to kind of wrangle the crowd. And uh, I was amazed also by how many, usually Americans, just talking. It's a chapel, and people just talking and chatting away. <laughs> and uh, I'm very reverent. I was, uh, you know, Pastor Chris and I had very different experiences. We both saw the beauty of the Vatican and of all of the museums and whatnot. Uh, I was more impressed with the Gothic beauty of um, and the expression of faith in the Catholic faith of the Vatican. Um, Pastor Chris was vexed sometime, probably, by some of the idolatry. <laughs> Well, she's right. She's right. But it was very beautiful. But this was one of the highlights of my trip and uh, I, uh, our trip. And I uh, I had to linger. It was so such a crowd. And oxygen was, you know, probably in short supply. Pastor Chris had to eventually just walk away, get out of there and get some fresh air somewhere. And we were separated for about, I don't know, an hour or so. And we finally reunited on the outside in one of the courts, I think, of the uh, of the Vatican, uh, beautiful, beautiful place. One of the most beautiful places on earth. Maybe the most beautiful place indoors I've ever been is the Vatican. But this was one of the highlights of that trip. Uh, it was one of the highlights of the opportunity to see some of the greatest art in the world that the world has ever known. And, um, and this is the creation of Adam. Uh, it's all one fresco made up of several vignettes and illustrating in a very modern sense, like uh, animating and bringing the Bible alive, that just that he had the faith and the dedication to to lay on his back and paint is just one of the most awesome feats of art in the history uh, of mankind. And uh, the vivid nature of what he did. Um, I want you to look at uh, the next, uh, uh, this next image. Uh, that is a close-up of uh, the creation of Adam. And uh, what do you notice about those hands? 
Tell me what you notice. Do you notice anything about those hands? Uh, you didn't come. You didn't know you were coming to art class, but uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to break this down a little bit. What, what do you see in these two hands? Okay, they look very realistic. Yeah, they look remarkably realistic. Anybody who is an artist knows that the hardest uh, thing to draw is hands. The hardest uh, um, anatomical part of the body uh, is, um, is hands because hands are so unmistakable and... Um, uh, hands um, uh, are very detailed. Uh, all hands have different fingerprints and have different appearances. And so they're very, very difficult uh, to uh, draw. And this man painted beautifully these hands. And so, yeah, Adam's hand is limp. And God's hand seems to be more energetic. Uh, can you see which one is God's hand and which one is... Adam's hand, uh, where's Adam's hand and where's God's hand? Yes, it's passive and active, yes, all good. The pointed one, well, you could say both of them are pointed. Be more specific. God on the right, yes, yes. And uh, this is kind of an anthropomorphism. These are physical or human traits that we're assigning to God that Michelangelo assigned to God for us to better understand him. So yes, God's hand is on the right. Is there anything that is, because um, I'm taking everything that you said, that uh, Adam's hand is more limp, God's hand is more uh, active and look stronger, that's for sure. They both seem to be reaching for each other. That's a very good uh, insight. Uh, uh, the realism, yes, is another thing. Very good. But is there anything that is a paradox or a seeming contradiction about God's hand being on the right? Anyone? Do you see a paradox or contradiction? What do you notice? What do you observe about that right hand? What do you reserve, observe about that right hand? By the way, he's not only on the right, that's his right hand. It's lower. Yes. Yeah. So someone please explain to me what was on Michelangelo's mind, this artist who almost single-handedly moved the world out of the dark ages. There was a dark ages. There was the medieval times. And his time were, was in the 1500s. And uh, the dark ages kind of made it into 1400. So it's not that long ago that the Catholic faith dominated Europe. And there's some very dark things that happened during the uh, medieval times. What would make this man, he clearly is a man of faith the way he, um, I'm describing the Sistine Chapel to you. And I'm describing my reverence. I had this reverence, not only as a person of faith, a follower of Christ, but also I, I reverence art, you know, and, um, and, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a nerd about art as it probably is apparent to you. So what is, um, why would Michelangelo depict God's hand lower than Adam who he's creating? What is that about? What do you think that is? Interesting. That's a pretty good one, Lise, that, uh, God meets us at our point of need. Yeah, yeah. That's an idea. Yes, I agree. That God meets us at our point of need. What else? Anything else? And it's interesting, too, that we all say that God's hand is the stronger hand. It's got uh, more intent. I, 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 so one of you wrote, it's more direct. That's true. It has more energy in the, in the pose of that hand. Um, and yet, uh, we said that Adam's hand, even though it's higher, is uh, more limp, yes, because he's coming to life based on the touch of God, okay? Um, what do you think that is? Okay, uh, that he's a lifter, okay? Y'all sound like y'all preaching now. Yes, that God is a lifter, uh-huh, yeah. I, I think that, I think that, um, go back to that uh, cover page. Uh, that cover page 
Um, and I mean, it's touched by by culture. Uh, these men look pretty Italian, or if not Italian, European. Um, you can see those are supposed to be angels. And he had a vivid imagination that he imagined God being surrounded by a host of angels. And there was this idea maybe to comfort people because infant mortality was so common that when children died, they became angels. So often you'll see an art um, that um, um, uh, angels are depicted as children. Uh, so he, this is a kind of depiction of his glory and his power. And uh, he is above, clearly, Adam, uh, in the whole frame. But when we go to the next, uh, let's go to the next uh, image, we see a kind of um, lower profile of uh, the hand on the right and uh, than we do on the left. And uh, you were saying, Jasmine, that you didn't think that it was necessarily lower. Just the angle of how God is positioned makes it look lower. I, I would think, and I, what do I know? I'm, I'm not an art critic, but I would think that what um, Michelangelo was after was to depict that God is not only a transcendent and infinite God who's omnipotent. This is an expression, this picture, this painting, this fresco of the omnipotence of God, which is the prism through which we're understanding ourselves tonight. This is a testament to the omnipotence of God. Yet, even though he's transcendent and omnipotent, God can come and be involved with his creation and come kind of under, to some degree, by the angle anyway, his creation to touch his creation and animate us um, um, uh, to make us living beings. Um, God breathed into Adam, the Bible says, and man became a living soul. And so um, God knows how uh, to get on our level, which is kind of akin to what some of you have said. Here's a, here's a kind of thought question before I, uh, do I want to do this? Yeah, I think I want to start this way. Here's a thought question. In your experience, in your experience, um, uh, let's go back to the uh, to the previous image. In your experience, is humankind conceited? Are we more prone to conceit, or are we more prone to self loathing? What do you think? Uh, humankind, when it comes to men and women, human beings, are we more prone to conceit? thinking maybe more highly of ourselves or being vain, having a high estimation of ourselves, or are we prone more to self-loathing? What do you think? What do you think? Okay. What do you think? All right. Okay. Interesting. Mm hmm So I hear self-loathing. I hear conceit. I hear depends on the day. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't I don't think the day can change the way that uh people tend to uh see themselves and interact with themselves. Uh okay, so it sounds like most of you say conceit. Now I'm interested. Why? Why do you say that? Why do you say that most people are prone to conceit? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Why do you say that most, for those of you that say, say conceit, why do you say that that man, humankind is more prone to conceit than self-loathing? Uh, I'd love to hear, uh, you can either raise your hand and I'll call on you, or you can write in the chat your answer, why do you choose conceit? Why? What is it that you see and observe in people? Uh, this is a subjective question. Um, okay, it's in our nature since eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, well, I would I would buy that. Um, uh, okay, all right. I hear defense mechanism. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, people operating on their own self knowledge. Uh, Proverbs three tells us to lean not to our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge Him, God, and He will direct our paths. 
Uh, but what what is the core of conceit? What are you seeing? What do you observe in people that makes them trend more towards conceit than they do self-loathing? Okay, anybody? Okay. Ah, oh, someone was told that they were conceited. Ah, isn't that interesting? That's interesting. The things our family tells us. And the person saying that uh, you was called conceited, uh, they definitely didn't know you very well, uh, Velma. <laughs> that has not been my experience of you in being conceited. So it's funny what our family, you know, remember the, uh, we would sell little girls, you know, you fast, she's fast. Remember that? And you could be labeled fast just because you were talkative or you had something to say. You'd be considered fast uh, or, oh, God forbid that you like boys because, you know, little girls and I suppose they like boys so, and some girls are very explorative and don't have a problem liking boys. Um, and they like boys from the beginning. Some girls don't go through an icky boy stage. They like boys from the beginning. Uh, some little girls like men from the beginning. And what I mean by that is they are aware of manly qualities and how it makes them feel. And I don't think there's anything inappropriate about that, that there are little girls even that notice that men are good looking or they are attentive or they're kind you know, even before they develop psychosexually, that they, you know, uh, enjoy the company of males. And, uh, but, you know, we have notions that somehow that girl's fast, you know, uh, that's what we say. Okay. So um, uh, I'm listening, I'm looking at some of your answers. Uh, okay. Um, all right. All right. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. And I'm getting some of this, this nuance. Some of you are splitting the difference. So why don't we, uh, and as, as you just said, uh, Deacon Darrell, the idea of uh, both at times, and I don't want to go part-time. I want to go definitively. Uh, men may be more conceited than women. <laughs> okay, you try to start fights on here. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's true, that men are more conceited than women. I don't know about that. You got to give me some data to prove that one. Um, uh, I'm sure you got some somewhere. Um, some of you who um, who are splitting the difference, because quite a few of you, I got two groups. I got one that says conceit, which was kind of dominant early in this discussion. Then I got those that say self-loathing. That was a fewer group. Then I got this mass of you who are trying to combine the two somehow. So I want somebody to raise your hand and tell me how you combining the two. Uh, one of you said mankind often puts its desires over the greater good that is polluting the environment, oppression, exploitation. Okay, that's, that's spoken like a true activist. I'm assuming that that's Eloise Young who wrote that. That sounds like Eloise Young and her activism. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, okay, so let's go to Monique. Monique, why are you splitting the difference? And then we'll go to Brother Dave. Well, you know, really, I'm not splitting the difference. What it is is that I'm bringing it down to its purest nature. Okay. Self-loathing self or what you call conceited. It, conceit comes down to insecurity. Inconce insecurity can actually boil down to an unsureness or even a hatred of yourself. So you, okay. you self-protect, you hide. So, so I, I'm. Go ahead. That, that's how come I'm bringing self-loathing and conceit into the same ballpark. Why don't you call what you just did splitting the difference? Because you just did exactly what I said you were doing. You Why? gave you gave the interrelationship between the two. So I don't see how I'm splitting the difference when they're one and the same. Oh, I see. So you believe that conceit is self-loathing? Yes. Oh, okay. All right, Grasshopper. Thou hast answered wisely. How about you, uh, Brother Dave? <clears throat> yeah, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm driving. Um, we can hear but, you. 
Okay. Yeah, I I kind of agree with Sister Monique's perspective. I think I've never really seen a person truly be conceited and believe it. I think underneath that, there's a, a level of insecurity and even self-hatred. And so the things that people do that are perceived as conceited, there's usually an underlying self-loathing or self-hatred um, about it. Very well said by both of you. Uh, and I must admit, I don't believe in trick questions, but that may have been a little bit of a trick question because I too believe, I too believe that conceit is a coping mechanism for self-loathing. That self-loathing shows up in all kinds of ways. Uh, people that talk a lot could be self-loathing because they're trying to control the narrative and, and fill the room with words. People who don't say anything could be a form of self-loathing. That if I don't say anything, nobody will know that I'm not that bright, <laughs> okay? Or no one will be able to judge what I say. Um, I'd rather observe rather than participate. Uh, we have all kinds of ways. I think overwhelmingly so. I don't think it's close. Overwhelmingly so. Even the life of the party is often self-loathing. The person who is the most... Uh, involved that has everybody's attention, the bell of the ball. Uh, there are persons who want to be the bell of the ball, who want to be noticed and seen and observed. Uh, they're exhibitionistic and uh, would like to show off. That's a form of self-loathing. Um, and so there's all kinds of ways that we cope with feelings of inadequacy. Feelings of inadequacy is um, endemic to being human. If you have never felt inadequate, you are either mentally ill or uh, you um, uh, are, are not at all self-aware. We all have times. And then a lot of us, even tonight, uh, we've had imposter syndrome, that when you do do something well, and you know you're good at something, you know you're brilliant. You know that you're genius at some things. You know that frequently, some of you, maybe not all of us can claim this, but some of you have frequently over the course of your life been the smartest person in the room. And I'm not saying that, you know, uh, I ain't got no agenda saying that, but you just are always, if not the smartest person, you one of the smartest people in the room. And you still have feelings of insecurity. Some of you are smarter than you come off. You try to hide your intelligence. Women are notorious at this uh, to not appear too intelligent so as not to be off-putting to men or to scare men away or to seem too deep uh, or to ask too many questions or, or, or whatever. So women are master contortionists in terms of hiding their superpowers and hiding the modicum of esteem that they have, because having esteem sometimes as a woman can cause crisis for a man, uh, that he needs somebody more compliant. And I'm not beating up on men either. I'm really not. I'm, I'm really just talking about culture and acculturation and socialization. And um, uh, church and Christianity has been great purveyors of this in terms of how we interpret people to one another. So being fast, you know, that, that probably came out of some Pentecostal church somewhere. Uh, you know, that we have, uh, on the basis of faith, we have told all kinds of lies about people, and we have said all manner of things about people. Um, uh, I was uh, looking at a documentary about Dr. King last night, and uh, I saw that he had about uh, about $56,000 in his, in his, um, his um, Nobel Peace Prize. And um, I've read this many times that he was afraid to use that money. He needed that money. He needed that money. He did not make a lot of money. He died with no insurance and was not wealthy at all because he put all of it he had back in the movement. And Harry Belafonte paid for his children's college, all four of them. Um, uh, and I think Harry Belafonte paid for the funeral. And so other uh, uh, celebrities, I think, helped out the, with the King children because he was so afraid of being categorized as an egomaniac. And uh, so many people have, uh, you know, we've seen that narrative. So I think that by far, people tend to be more self-loathing, hence your homework assignment. Now we can go to the homework assignment. Um, uh, and so uh, I wanted you to meditate on Psalm 139, 13, and 14. 
And I told you that fearfully means reflecting God's character, that which reflects God's character in the omnipotence of his creation. God is the only uh, being in the universe who can create ex nihilo. Ex nihilo for Latin uh, translates as out of nothing. God can create something out of nothing. The universe is something, matter, out of nothing. He creates ex nihilo. We reshape. Uh, raw materials into things and build homes or skyscrapers and shocking how quickly a building can go up in our day and we build all kinds of machines and but it's made of the raw materials that God created and so that which is fearfully made is that which God reverences himself because it reflects his character that which is wonderfully made is that which reflects God's imagination that God used his divine imagination in making you um, I'll say more about that in a moment. So here was my reflection question. I'm so interested to hear your responses. List three traits about yourself that are fearful and also three traits about yourself that are wonderful, okay? I will go first so you know what I'm looking for. Uh, when it comes to how Paul James is made fearfully, I am deeply rational and strategic. I'm a tremendous strategic thinker. Um, um, very strategic, good listener. I know how to listen and analyze what I hear. I know how to pick up on unstated things that people don't say or wouldn't dare say and discern. So some of that comes from this rationality that God has built into me. Some of it is a defense mechanism and has been perfected based on my own wounds. But there's a big part of that that God put there and he made me strategic. I'm very strategic. I'm good in a jam. I'm good in crisis. Um, uh, some of that is born of the crisis that I came from in my family system, my family of origin. But that's a fearful thing that God can put in a little boy at one point, as I was, this kind of strategic and rationality that is kind of rare. I am remarkably resilient and indefatigable. Uh, most things don't wear me out. Most people don't wear me out. I might be in the right uh, profession, the right uh, life calling and vocation, and that people generally don't wear me out. Even difficult people, in fact, difficult people, and I got to be careful about this too. <laughs> difficult people uh, challenge me. I I, I kind of like difficult people <laughs> because with difficult people, you know where you stand. So, but I, where I have to be careful is that all difficult people don't want to be helped and don't, you know, don't want to be shepherded. A lot of difficult people, the way they show they're difficult is they don't want to be shepherded. So I got to be very careful because um, I can get roped into features that God has not held me accountable for. Hence our last class in this series, the sovereignty of God. There's a sovereignty of God. We're going to look at who we are next week, commercial. Uh, through the sovereignty of God next week. But this week, we're talking about omnipotence. And so the fearful thing in me, sometimes, you know, my being resilient and indefatigable, I don't, I don't get worn out. I'm determined, right? Determined um, in ways to surprise myself. I, I, I'm a seer capable of foretelling and forthtelling the truth. I can see stuff that most people don't see. I'm a prophet. That's fearful to me. I don't want to be a prophet. I don't want to have insight. I don't want to speak the truth. I don't want to say something that the 10 preachers in the room all say. I, I really loathe that state of my life that I feel a nudge of the Holy Spirit and there's a room full of preachers and I'm the one that's going to say it. Oh, I don't like that. It makes me so uncomfortable. And I'm fearful. That's a fearful part of me that I know I ain't put there. Uh, the wonderful thing, I have an inner child full of wonder and adventure who no matter what can't be killed. Uh, what I thought was maybe the most vulnerable and unsafe part of me, I have come to learn as a mature man is the very most resilient part of me. The child part of me, like I preached a couple of weeks ago, is the most uh, resilient. So this inner child, um, I named my son Jason, I would call him Jason the Wonder Boy. And I think maybe that I recognized the wonder in his face because it was me looking back at me. Uh, I didn't know that at all then as a young father trying to figure out what it means to raise a child. 
Uh, I'm wonderful in that I have an inner sensitivity to beauty and uh, can spend 10 minutes opening up a Bible class about Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. <laughs> and so I'm reverence to the creative. I have a creative side. And then lastly, I have a rare capacity for loving people beyond even my own human limitations because I'm human and flawed. But I love people deeply. I love people deeply. That's wonderful. I, I, that comes from the imagination of God because that does not serve me well all the time. And some of the things that I've said, maybe a full, maybe most of the things I said about myself that are fearful and wonderful have caused me great problems and consternation because they're expressions of God that transcend and go beyond who I think I want to be and how I want to show up in a room. Okay, hopefully you get that. So I wanted to model that for you. You tell me now. You tell me. Uh, I want you to raise your hand for this one. I want some brave people. Raise your hand and tell all of us what is fearful about you and what is wonderful. What I don't want to do is have to call on people, all right? So if I see this thing going slow, I'm going to call on people. Um, and so um, let's go to Velma. Velma. Oh, Hey guys, can you hear me? Y'all better raise y'all hand because I want to hear everybody as well. We can hear you. We can hear. We're going to hear everybody, but we're going to hear a few. Go ahead. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't spend as much time as I wanted to with this. I'm so disappointed and I'm not trying to make excuses. It's just want to let you know that. But I do know the Holy Spirit told me, Velma, you are a finisher. Ah. Um, wow. Yes. Um, I, and it encouraged me so much because I know the one thing in my life that I'm concerned about more than anything else is that I do what God created me to do before he called me home. Okay. So, so that, that really blessed me. Is that um, fearful? Do you think that's born of the character of God or his imagination? I think it's born of the character of God. Fearful. I agree with you. I agree with yes. you. Yes. You have anything else you want to tell me? Um, j Just that with that one. Good. I, I, mean, I'm, I, I think that's I'm, fine. I'm probably going to be camping right here with this past Good. for yeah. like the next couple of months. Maybe all year. I don't know. But yeah, then you if, need to um, do that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do that. You do that. That's great. Yeah. That may be a good thing. You don't have to give me as many as I gave. Um, But if you want to, that's fine. Uh, let's go to Michelle Dawson. Michelle Dawson. Um, one of the things, um, good evening, everybody. One of the good things I kind of did is that I really felt like I needed to go to school on this. So um, I kind of looked up the words like fearfully and wonderfully, and I looked up the Hebrew translations for them because um, fearfully doesn't mean to be afraid, but rather um, carefully crafted with honor and reverence and wonderful individual purpose and set apart. So I had to kind of do that before I could do the assignment. Uh -huh. And then um, I wanted to kind of, I didn't really have time to to work it out all the way I wanted to, but I thought about how do you reflect on your character and um, God's imagination. And I think when you're reflecting on yourself, it's like a threefold purpose. So it's how you see yourself, it's how others see you in the community and how the world sees you. Mm -hmm. So then I went on to um, to kind of look at some different Bible verses. And I think it's something that's always like you're always transforming and mm -hmm. you don't stay in one like you're always growing, hopefully. So I looked at Philippians 1, 6 about that. He who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. Mm -hmm. And I also looked at Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth, unite my heart to fear your name. So those are kind of, that's like the background of how I got to my answer. Good. So the traits um, that I saw about myself are fearful is to be in awe of God in my life. One was seeking God's guidance in situations like discernment, um, accepting God's will when I don't understand and having hope without explicit proof. And that's something that I think that you do throughout your life. That's something that's like something that you grow into and it's something that you do throughout your life. It's not something you're born with and knowing how to be still and trusting God in situations and relying on God's ability. So those are the first three things for being fearful mm -hmm. and wonderful. I would say 
encouraging others wherever God sends me. And I call it seeking to refrain from the Jonah complex because you know how Jonah was, um, he didn't want to go to Nineveh and he was trying to run away. And there's some situations that you can't run away from. God might plant you somewhere you don't want to be, but you need to find why he planted you there and do as well. Um, speaking in love with all types of people and diffusing like difficult situations. And I kind of call that learning the language of Moses by seeking God's guidance in what to say and how to say it. And the third one was the realization that seeking to be a better person is a lifelong journey. And I would just call that the Route 66 journey. There's 66 books in the Bible. So um, just going on a journey and learning about God's um, word and keeping it in your heart. And it's like a learning process and you're always um, learning. So to be a better person. Wow. Well, very good, Michelle Wilson Dawson. That uh, she uh, spoken like a true educator. She she went to the nth degree on that. I'm going to go to uh, Michelle, excuse me, Lisa Outerbridge. Okay, did I lose Lisa? Where are you at, Lisa? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. For um, fearful, I put that I am a deep processing person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm put faithful and respectful. Mm -hmm. For wonderful, I put friendly and I have a heart for serving and helping people in particular young women and seniors okay very good very good wonderful all right so let's go to Yes. Let's go to Kiara. Yeah, we got Kiara. Hello? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. This is Christiana. Did you want me? Oh, I thought I had Kiara. Oh, no? okay. I thought, I'm here, I thought... but Tina, you can go first if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, let's ha let's hear from uh Christiana Bogart. Uh and then <laughs> we'll hear Cr Christiana Bogart, then Kiara Maddox. Um, the part of me I believe that's very that's fearful is um order um and I like order and I'm a nurturer and um go back again say that again you move too fast for me so oh, give it to me again the fearful ones is that order like I like things in order uh, yeah I, I mm -hmm. like to I can take things that are not in order and put them in order. And okay. then I am a nurturer. I'm caring. All right. Is that born of uh, you're putting things in order? Is that born of God's character or is that born of your trauma of yeah. things maybe not being in order in your life earlier? Um, I think it's both. Yes, I agree with you. It's Good. both. It's I just both. wanted to see. I just want to see how you respond. <laughs> yeah. God okay. uses the, our, our traumas and difficult times to be the point of expression of who he is so that's good and then you said nurturing yes okay very good and what um else? and and then my traits that is um one that's wonderful is that i make things better um mm -hmm. no matter like if i'm in a situation i look to make things better and i'm a visionary so mm -hmm. something that has not existed i can see it and then i want to see it happen or i work to make that happen Mm -hmm. Good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Good answers. Very, very good. All right, Kiara. Um, for me, I got um for the fearful part, I put I am systematic. So I see um kind of gaps in uh processes. So I'm I can um, kind of fill the gaps in different areas. Um, okay, sometimes I, it's called systems thinker. You're a systems thinker? Yes, I'm a Good. systems thinker. Uh -huh. um, I am prophetic. 
Mm. Um, and I also am discerning. Um, for the wonderful part, I am a redemptive lover. Um, I can relate to all ages. So I didn't know how to say this, but from young, young children to uh, older um, persons, and I am able to bring joy to situations. Excellent. Excellent. Well said. Well said. Um, how about you, uh, Deacon Alice? All right. For me, when um, the fearful part, I was really concentrating on how I see God's character manifesting through me. So for that, I picked patient, hopeful, and loving. Mm -hmm. And Ooh. for the wonderful part I, that, you know, reflects God's imagination, I picked grace. I picked... Um, did I say graceful, graceful, peaceful, mm -hmm. and stubborn or, or determined? Mm -hmm. To me, determined sounds better than stubborn, but I'm really stubborn. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. Boy, you're showing good self-awareness mm -hmm. before I talk about it next week. Very good. Well done. Well done. Well done. So you all did a great job. I, I wonder how you felt about that. Did you feel comfortable thinking about yourself uh, in fearful ways in terms of how your character, I kind of use kind of a transliteration. I think that uh, Michelle did a good job breaking down uh, what fearful means, that which is reverential and reflective of honor. And uh, what that means really is reflecting God's character and then wonderfully reflecting God's imagination. Those are both kind of simplifications and of uh, what I meant by that. I wonder how you felt uh, thinking about yourself as fearfully and wonderfully made. That which is fearful about you, that which is wonderful about you. You did a great job with that. I want you to continue to play with that and think about that. Um, as I think that uh, God wants to deliver us and give us a more accurate sense of who we are. The Bible does not say, don't think too highly of yourself. The Bible says, don't think, uh, the Bible does not say that we shouldn't think highly of ourselves, I should say. But the Bible does say that we should not think too highly of ourselves. We shouldn't have uh, an exaggerated estimation of who we are, which equates to conceit. But uh, we should think highly of ourselves. Um, we should think highly. We've been talking about this working definition of identity. And I told you that identity is the complex of personal traits and qualities and characteristics of the human self that distinguish one individual from another, and it reflects the intelligent design of each individual's personality and purpose, which originates in God's mind and harmonizes with his plan for human history. That's a very full definition of your identity, that God is involved in your identity. And then we talked about faith bypass. I keep mentioning it because I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that many Christians fail to grow because they use their faith to bypass the hidden parts of themselves that stem from trauma. And uh, God has called us, therefore, to confront our pain and our wounds and our secret self and what we think about them. And our inner life always shapes our outer world. Let me give you some of the self-discovery keys that we've uh, talked about. The first uh, self-discovery key um was embracing God's omniscience allows me to discover my true self. When I know that God knows me better than anybody else, I'm on the road to discovering how God sees me and who I really am. The second self-discovery key I gave you last week was that self-discovery is the courage to never hide from my true self. It's the courage to never hide from my true self because David's reaction uh, to the omniscience of God is, where can I hide? I, I this information, this knowledge that you have of me is too wonderful, and I, I, I feel naked before you. I feel inadequate before you. And then the third, uh, tonight, new, self-discovery is the realization that the omnipotent God has always been a causative agent, intimately involved with my perfect primal and prehistoric selves. My kind of argument tonight 
is that all of us have perfect self, we have a primal self, and we have a prehistoric self, uh, all borne out in the scripture of these six verses, uh, verses uh, 13 through 18 of Psalm 139. First, you have a, a perfect self. Um, you are your perfect self. You are your perfect self. Uh, there is a very clear sense, and it's put forth in the scripture, uh, that you are perfect. You're perfect. Uh, that, um, And it says in verse 13, by the way, if I uh, freeze, I've been having some issues with my internet. Uh, just be patient with me, and my uh, team will let me know, and I'll be back shortly. All right? But um, I'm, I'm still trying to troubleshoot and work that out. Um, the Bible says in uh, verse 13 of uh, this passage, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. I have mastered the idea that I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that you are my creator. This text is saying a lot of things. It's saying your personality was engineered by God. There may be things that you don't like about yourself or that you are ashamed of about yourself. Maybe you think you're a crybaby or maybe you think you are this or that. I'm too talkative or I don't talk enough. Your personality was engineered by God. Who you really are was engineered by God. Your inner self was crafted by God. You created my inmost being. That is at the soul level, at the personality level, God created you. He knit you together uh, in your mother's womb. There is a kind of uh, allusion to um, the weaving of a tapestry, the weaving of a rug. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And here it is. For you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do, in this case, for you to do. And so your inner self was crafted by God, and you were created with a reverent precision concerning God's calling and purpose upon your life. He always had a calling. He always had a purpose uh, on your life. You were created with God's potent imagination, uh, there's no one else quite like you. Uh, there's none, no one else quite like you. Uh, you come from the potent imagination of God, and you're a crowning masterpiece of God's handiwork. That is, that uh, after God made the universe and made the earth, uh, he made you, and he saw you as his crowning work. You are the crowning work of God. You are perfect. This uh, calls to mind Psalm 8, that you have a primacy in the universe. I don't understand that. With all of the immensity and complexity of the universe, and when you look into the heavens and you look at the constellations of stars, the Pleiades, and you look at uh, uh, the Big Dipper, and you look at shooting stars, God says uh, uh, that you are special. Psalm, Psalm 8 says this, when I consider your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? It shows us that David is not only devotional, David is scientific. That when he looks in his limited education, but his ample mind at the complexity and immensity of the universe. Mind you, he could look into the sky and see millions of stars because there was no electricity in his day electricity, and particularly where we live. You and I live in the brightest part on Earth. We live the brightest region of Earth. The northeastern America is the brightest uh, uh, section of all the Earth. And so we can't see the stars like he could because the light on Earth competes with the heavens. He says, when I look at the moon and I look at the stars, and I look at the handiwork of your fingers. I say, what is mankind that you're mindful of them and human beings that you care about them? 
You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You and I are crowned with glory and honor. Lord, have mercy. Don't feel like that sometime on a Wednesday, but you are crowned with glory and honor because God has crowned you with purpose in your perfect self. I'm not talking about your sin life. I'm not talking about whether you stumble or fall short of the glory of God. Of course you do. But the original design of who you are is perfect. You are made a little lower than the angels. Angels are supernatural beings who are constantly in the presence of God. And David comes up with this brilliant phraseology that we, you and I, are just created a little lower than the angels. You've made uh, us rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything uh, under the angels' feet and therefore us as well. Uh, you are the crowning masterpiece, the crowning masterpiece of God's handiwork. Uh, God has created you uh, um, in a crowning manner uh, over all of his creation. But then you have a primal self. Uh, you have a primal self. Uh, there's a primitive version of you. Um, the Bible says in verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. And what David does is very brilliant. He uses agrarian terms to describe the just, the human gestation process, that just like babies begin uh, as an embryo and grow into a fetus, there's the zygote and the embryo and the fetus and the baby that is born. Um, he was aware that there are developmental stages in the gestation, the developmental process of a baby in utero, and he likens it unto a seed being planted in the earth, in soil. You are like a seed that were planted in your mother's womb. Your frame, as it took form, you had soft bones, your skull was not fully formed. You were born, your skull is not completely fused. And um, David is saying, my frame, my bones, literally, were not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, the secret place of the mother's womb that is like the secret place of the earth where seed germinates and um, uh, plants and uh, uh, life forms, biological life forms sprout. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, he's using the mother's womb like a seed in the depths of the earth before I would spring forth and be visible to everybody else. He says, before I was visible to everybody else, just like a seed underneath the surface of the earth, you saw my unformed body. Think about that. Think about that. If there are features of your body you don't like, Think about the fact that God says uh, uh, that I saw your unformed body. David testifies. So your physiology was planned by God, your physiology. In fact, you are a tapestry. You're a work that God wove together through DNA, through family history, through experiences. Uh, I actually believe in epigenetics. Epigenetics is a kind of a newer science that that which happened to people before us shows up in our DNA code or shows up in um, the way we navigate life. Uh, I, I like to watch the show on PBS, uh, Finding Your Roots. I'm particularly excited with Black folk on that show uh, with uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, who's over African-American studies for Harvard. And uh, this man has changed the world with DNA research. And he has a large apparatus behind him that follows. I mean, you can't just do it with black people. I, I would just love to see black people, but you got to study everybody. Uh, we we know the least about ourselves. So I'm fascinated. And he's a lot of famous people uh, like Ava DuVernay. I just watched last week. He was uh, he did uh, LeVar Burton, who was in Roots all those years ago. And uh, uh, it's all in the person. Some people are excited and engaging. Some people are kind of dry about their um their uh lineage and um and then there are surprises that happen remember the father in modern family the dark-haired man he's the father of the uh, family has a blonde-haired wife and he, i think he had three children on that show i didn't watch that show that much but i can't remember that actor's name who was on modern family 
but it turns out that he was the offspring uh, of a black woman in Oregon. <laughs> and that man was so excited to be black <laughs> that he said, I knew it. I knew it. And uh, he could, you know, he was so excited. I knew I had black blood somewhere in me. Um, what I was going to say, though, is that oftentimes what people do for a living, whether it be politics or industry or art, acting, music, they'll find a forebearer earlier in their lineage that had the same traits as them that was passed down somehow. You are the woven part, sometimes the scrap parts of all that preceded you. You represent, in many cases, the best and the brightest of what came before you. I really believe that there are times where our father cannot finish well, and our fathers, our mothers cannot manage uh, some achievements, and God raises you up to be more in some ways than your parents or your uncle or your aunts or your grandparents were. Uh, you have a primal self. Um, you're a tapestry that is reflective of DNA. You've been woven together through all of the pieces of your family story. You are com you're complex. You're made up, you're full of paradoxes. You know, you got like, you have, uh, some of you are introverted. You don't like to, you, 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 uh, you, you could do without people, you, you know, a perfect day for you. One of the things I do to find out whether people are introverts or extroverts, I'll say, uh, tell me your perfect day. Tell me your perfect day. People are usually alarmed. A perfect day? I mean, I, I got to, you know, they got to go back and forth with me a few minutes because nobody ever asks, what is your perfect day like? It's a rare question. Tell me, it's seven in the morning and I want you to take me to the end of the day. What is your perfect day? Uh, invariably, when people tell me their perfect day, I can tell whether they're introverted, they charge their batteries by being alone, or whether they're extroverted uh, and they charge their batteries by being around other people. When I hear people talk for long periods of time about what they're going to do by themselves and they don't mention anybody until maybe seven o'clock at night, see, that's an introvert. That's an introvert. But you know what? A lot of introverts are called to be leaders, to spend a lot of time with people and to help people and to lead people. Uh, maybe you don't know this, but I'm an introvert. I'm not an uh, extreme introvert. I'm kind of in the middle, but I'm on the introverted side of the middle. Um, uh, and I love being alone. I love solitude. Uh, and, um, solitude is what helps you to be an effective leader, to spend time in the presence of the Lord and to spend time thinking. Uh, a lot of the problems of people could be solved if they just went into a room alone and would be quiet. <laughs> being alone in a room quiet could solve most of the problems of the world. Um, uh, no wiser thing I will say tonight. So that's a paradox that you could do with or without people and you're a good leader. Um, uh, and there are some other things. Uh, you don't like to do public speaking, but yet you're articulate. There are things that God does. You know, you, you, know, you uh, are shy, but you're a great performer. Great performer. You're very good at performing in front of people. Uh, very, very good. Very, very good. I don't think he'd mind me saying this, but I remember Deacon Rusty was telling me, you know, I like to be in the background. Uh, he was in my office some years ago. I like to be in the background, Pastor. I said, no, you don't. He said, yeah, what do you mean? No, I don't. I said, you don't like to be in the background because I've seen you perform in front of the congregation. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen Deacon Rusty act. He is quite the thespian. He has played villains in uh, VBS, delighting children and adults alike. I mean, he threw himself into Dr. Careless, I think was one of his villain uh, villains that he created. Um, he likes to perform, but we have not had a lot of encouragement in our families and in other places to be performers. And so he is good on a stage. He functions well behind the scenes, and he's good at supporting other people who lead, but he's equally good at leading and commanding the audience. That's a paradox. Uh, there's potential in you and predestination in you. You have a perfect self, but you got a primal self. That is your undeveloped self. 
The things that are undeveloped in you and unexplored in you that God wants to call forth uh, based on this passage of scripture, that your frame is not hidden from God. He wove you together with his own power, his own omnipotent hand, and his eyes see all about you that is unformed and that has been underdeveloped. All the ways you hide and got us fooled that you ain't as gifted. We deal with that a lot in care of you. A lot of people hide and and not coming forth with their anointing and their gifts. I believe it's in the house. Everything we need is in the house. We got hidden preachers. We got hidden singers. We got hidden worship leaders. We got hidden prayer warriors. We got hidden prophets. We got hidden evangelists. We got hidden everything. Amen. Because God sees your unformed substance. I like how the King James puts it. He sees your unformed substance. You are substantive. You're full of wonder and full of imagination, full of genius, because God put that genius there. God put that anointing there. And the Pentecostal folks said it. It ain't in the Bible, but it's biblical. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing, God, signing off on your gifting, signing off on your specialness. That's why Pastor James said, how are you wonderful? How are you fearful? Because I want you to prophesy over yourself. The things that are in your character that you know nobody put there that reflect the nature of God. I wanted you to prophesy the things about you that reflect the creativity of God because there's nobody else like you in your family. Nobody else like you in your neighborhood. Some of you are interested in things. God has put your focus on things that nobody else is noticing and nobody else is interested in. And here you come fixating on certain things because he sees your unformed substance. God sees your frame and it's not hidden. He knows your infrastructure, the infrastructure of your potential. He sees all the impossibility and improbability in you. And sooner or later, he wants to call you out of your primal self. And so for some of us, it's time for us to develop. Even though we were born and we developed in the womb, we have been underdeveloped postnatally. You have not given back all that God has put in you in weaving you painstakingly in framing you and framing your life and seeing your unformed substance. You're complex and full of paradoxes, seeming contradictions. Lastly, lastly, you are your prehistoric self. You are your prehistoric self. The Bible says all the days for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God ordained your life. The steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. God ordained. I want you to think about that for a minute. Hallelujah. There have been some days you've met that have shook you to your foundations. Can you remember the worst day of your life? Can you remember the saddest day of your life? Can you remember your biggest loss? Anybody die in your life? You ever lose somebody that really saw you and loved you and knew who you were, that could talk to you in shorthand, that could summon your greatness, summon the hidden dimensions of you? They got you. Is there anything more comforting? That's that that comforting is not the word. Is there anything that's more, more like jet fuel than when somebody gets you? Maybe it was a grandmother, maybe it was an aunt, maybe it was a teacher. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, you know, God gave me a lot of great teachers. Um, I've had too many great teachers uh, for one person. Um, when my mother and father were broken up and I had become aware that I had a broken family, God's grace is sufficient, but I came from a broken family. And I, my father was absent. And my second grade teacher was a young man in his early 20s. Uh, fresh out of Amherst College, and uh, he hadn't met any black people really and had relationship with them until he went to Amherst College in New England and uh, and uh, had sweetmates that were black. And the black sweetmates in the late 60s called him Snowflake and uh, taught him how white he was. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and this man came all the way from Illinois to the city of Philadelphia to be my second grade teacher. And he had red hair, full red long hair. He had red beard. 
And I really thought he was Jesus. I thought he was like a earthly manifestation of Jesus, this redhead Jesus in my life. And um, that man, Kent Peterson, my wife asked me one day, you know, uh, who, she, I can't remember the question. She so, said something like, uh, who impacted me the most in my life, you know? And I think I was saying the Apostle Paul, but then it came to my Kent Peterson. And then as I talked about it, I began to just weep and cry and realize that in a very pivotal time in my development, when I needed, yes, who are my heroes? Thank you. Who was my hero? And I mean, 50 years had gone by, really, just about. And I mentioned this man's name after all these years. And I began to weep because this this white man got me and understood me. And then I read a progress report where he read, talked about me as a fine young man who was very thoughtful and deep. And Paul is a deep thinker and a serious child. And he, he, he almost spoke prophetically about who I was. And at the time, he wasn't walking in faith. And, um, and uh, long story short, you know, I looked that man up and found out that he was one of the world's experts on educational environments and uh, had taught at Vanderbilt University, University of Wisconsin. He was a great educator who educated educators. And, you know, I looked that man up and got in touch with him again after almost 50 years. And, you know, we're friends again. And uh, I've told him the impact he's had on my life because he got me. He saw me. Um, he saw some of my primal stuff. But I want you to know that my days were ordained to meet that man because there were some things in Kent Peterson that my own father couldn't have given me. My pastor at the time couldn't have given me. Uh, the fact that he was a white man was very, very critical to my development, very critical to be around a very intelligent, smart, uh, 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 high uh, affinity, strong white man in my life. Uh, and um, we can't ever do a Zoom or, a, uh, or any kind of video conferencing without spending several hours together. And the love is that we tell each other we love each other before we finish our Skype or our um, Zoom. Um, God knew that I needed that man in my life before any of my days came to be. God knew that he would send an angel. He knew that he would send Waylon Wilson to teach me soccer. And he knew he would send me uh, Robert Massey to teach me about black world history. He taught me about the Hittites and King Thutmose III and how many black people were the architects of civilization for the earth. Woo, Lord have mercy. Uh, uh, I mean, just amazing. The teachers that I got over and over and over again uh, that looked out for me and taught me um, You've lost some people. Uh, God ordained those people to be in your life. Um, uh, how precious to me are your thoughts, God? How vast is the sum of them? Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Uh, this The psalmist is saying that, David is saying that, if, if I were to go to the Jersey Shore and look at the grains of sand along the entire Jersey Shore, remember he's near the Negev, the Negev, the desert, is bigger than the Jersey Shore. And he's making the frame of reference a desert. I'm going to say the Jersey Shore to contextualize it for us. The grains of sand on the Jersey Shore don't equal the thoughts of God about just you. That's the point. That there's a prehistoric self that you are that didn't exist. Before God said, let there be light, you've always been on the mind of God. You've always been on the mind of God. Maybe somebody forgot about you, but not God. Did you know God always mapped out your life? He mapped out your life before you got here. And he knew there'd be pain and setbacks. He knew there'd be heartbreak. Uh, he knew there would be experiences that almost dismantled you and broke you. Um, some of you have had painful things happen to you. And God bubbled you. He shielded his purpose. He shielded his purpose. Things that were, the devil meant it for evil to destroy you. But what God did is he took the painful pieces of your life. Somebody abandoned you. 
Somebody did you harm that lasted, that you got the wound that you can still see. God mapped out your life. Ultimately, you can't stay mad at people to be a bitter person because God mapped out your life. Ultimately, we can't be but so angry at people because God mapped out your life because all the days ordained for you were written by God. That's a kind of metaphor. God is not literally writing a book, but a book is the uh, visual representation of stored knowledge, that my life is a book. And God wrote in the book before I was born. Hallelujah. And listen, what God has said that you're going to have, nobody can steal from you. I, I, y'all, somebody ain't listening like you should right now. You should, you, you've been listening to Pastor James. That, that you know, my father used to have a saying, and uh, he says, if somebody try to get in the way of your blessing, you'll get it faster. <laughs> I didn't realize how wise that was, maybe until after he was gone. But I've seen God accelerate blessing in my life as I got spiritual attack on my life. Whew, Lord have mercy. As the enemy, I can, you know, there have been times I've walked in rooms where I could feel the hatred of the enemy. God, you know, let me tell you something. The enemy hates God's man. The enemy hates God's woman. And it ain't personal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Get your eyes off of flesh and blood. Stop naming the name that's the bane of your existence. Stop lying. It is not your ex. It is not your blank. It's not your boss. It's not your coworker. God mapped out all of your life and built Listen, he built in opponents to agitate you to greatness. Lord have mercy. God is trying to uh, make in real time the real time manifestation of your prehistoric self. God has already promised over you. Hallelujah. God has already promised and spoken over you and sung songs over you before you were born. You've always been on God's mind. God has never been God without you on his mind. Think about that in the eternality of God. you And look at this. You've always been beloved by God. You've always been beloved by God. Who walked out on you? Who broke your heart? Who told you you weren't attractive or you weren't lovable? Who made you feel like you weren't lovable? Could it be that they're on God's payroll? Woo! Lord have mercy. Because God does not just bless with invocation in invoking his own presence. You know how God blesses? God blesses through the benediction. Oh, Lord. You didn't know it, but God declared a benediction on some people in your life and they ain't coming back. You are never going to see the Egyptians again. And you fell in love with the Egyptians. You, you kind of like them leeks and onion sandwiches. You you learn how to put hot sauce on them leeks and onion sandwiches and make them taste good. You you worked with it. <laughs> and God says, I've given a benediction for some people. Did you know God can give the benediction to the person that got you, that loved you for you, that encouraged you, that gave you rocket fuel to believe you could do something? Then they left and he said, well, what am I going to do now? So that they would not be an idol. They were never the, to be there long they were there to just give you a sense of yourself that you got to walk in now. When are you going to walk in your full self? God has been faithful to show you who you are a long time ago. Listen, you are you have always been beloved. Oh, Lord have mercy. It's too profound to unpack. You've always been beloved. And beloved, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we can even fully grasp being beloved by God. Uh, He who did did not withhold his own son, will he not also freely give us all things? He gave you the best he had in his son, Jesus Christ. You've always been beloved. The difficult prickly parts of you, you've always been beloved. Some of your prickly parts was not even original to you. You learned how to be prickly to survive. You've always been beloved by God. You've always been beloved. He watched over every stage of your development. He watched over every aspect of your existence before, during, and after. You've always been beloved. You are, you have always been, 
and you always will be under God's constant watch. You're under God's constant watch. How precious to me are your thoughts. It's awkward. The language is awkward in the Bible. How precious to me are your thoughts. How precious to me are your thoughts. David is awkwardly saying, it blows my mind as the spirit of revelation shows me that you think so much about me as a shepherd boy who didn't smell good and was forgotten about his father and his brothers and lived in obscurity. I, I How precious to me are your thoughts at the lowest point of my life you were thinking about me? How vast is the sum of your thoughts that got me all the way to this palace? If I were to count all of the thoughts it took on your part to bring me from obscurity to the place of prominence, it would outnumber all the grains of the sand in the Negev desert. It was near me. And then on top of that, look at this, when I awake, you're still staring at me and looking at me, overseeing the prehistoric implications that you spoke into existence before I have become obedient and lived them out. God has mapped out all of your life. Hallelujah. You've always been on God's mind. You've always been on God's heart. You've always been beloved, and you don't need him, her, or them to love you because you've always been beloved. And you know God is so faithful. He'll raise up people that love you. Right here on this Zoom, you're very beloved. Some of you, it's amazing to me. You don't realize how loved you are, how loved you are. Um, there have been times of work of the spirit, men's event. One men's advance, all of the men just started loving on Dave Brown because he was brave enough to share where he has not always felt beloved. And all of the men just ganged up on him. And what they love and admire about it, it was the most beautiful thing to see men just say, how wonderful you are. Dave, you don't realize how much I admire you, man. You the man. <laughs> and it wasn't excessive. And it wasn't inappropriate. Because this man shared his wounds with such bravery. Men don't do that. Men don't share their wounds of the origin. I made him tell the origin story of where he was wounded. And then I sicked all the men on him. It's amazing. And I remember we had another day, Barbara. You know, I never felt really like I belong. You know, this man is largely making care of you go. Tell my <laughs> that he was appreciated. You what? I mean, it's amazing what we think in our head. Remember what I said at the top of the study? Are we prone to conceit or self-loathing? I mean, if you look at Dave Barber, all the stuff this man do, just the gift of service, gift of helps. Dave Barber uh, tallies my love offering. He makes the pie. I don't touch my offering at all. Dave Barber does that. There's not just, you know, I wouldn't just ask anybody to do that. That man is a faithful man. That man has grown in stature. But he didn't get a sense of how beloved he was. He didn't get it. I said, so, you know, we did. We spent about 20 minutes. Do you know how beloved you are? It's a beautiful thing. We don't do it enough. We don't do it enough. We need to do it more to just give you a snapshot of how you're seen. You're so beloved. You're so beloved. And it's not because you're perfect. It's not because you're always delightful. It's not because you're a peach. It's because, you, it's because you loved by God, and we can't help but to love you. We fall in love with you because we see the love of God on you. We can't help but fall in love with one another in the body of Christ because God loves us so much. You've always been beloved by God. I'll say it again. You've always been beloved by God. and You've always been under his constant watch. Always. Here's a last statement. Look at this. You... This is not fatal. You are the author of your own life story. You are the author of your own life story. That almost sounds like motivational speaking. And it almost sounds secular, doesn't it? But David is not saying that my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. And David is not saying that because you wove me together in the depths of my mother's womb, because you saw my unformed substance, 
And David is not saying that because all my days were ordained for me and written in your book, this kind of metaphor for the knowledge of God, like a book. He's not saying that God is the sole author. God gives plot lines. Mm, 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 mm. God sends characters, role players in your life, but you are the author of your own life story. You're not doomed. Your life is not isolated to who gave birth to you or what the relationship was like. I can't imagine being Cain. I mean, maybe I'm crazy that I have a little bit of compassion for Cain who killed his brother Abel. But Cain, not Abel, was born into tumult. Imagine being kicked out of the presence of God and there being a supernatural sword blocking the entry to the Garden of Eden that God makes clear, I don't want anything to do with you relationally at this time. How did they must have felt, Adam and Eve? And then they have a baby. And he was born in all of this darkness, this awareness of that we blew it, this lapsarian reality. He could have been born into a perfect reality, but because of his parents' disobedience, he was born you know, as a baby, he saw animals go and snatch other animals. He saw bloodshed. Uh, he saw his father kill living things. It did something to him. It, it made him psychopathic. <laughs> I don't think I'm stretching to say that Cain, the first child of the Bible, was psychopathic. The first baby in the Bible is a psychopath, eventually. Maybe not born that way, became psychopathic and killed his brother. Uh, fr fratricide. Um, because he thought that his parents' story defined his. Abel proved otherwise. And he didn't know how to deal with a brother who had a worship life. He didn't know how to deal with a brother that could give the best that he had and wasn't just so busy trying to scratch and survive but I'm going to give God the best that I have because I know God is good. And I know my parents have blown it and I know the story, but I want to give it a sacrifice of praise. Cain couldn't handle it. Cain couldn't handle it. He killed him. God said his blood is crying out from the ground. Um, um, you're the author, nobody else. God is not going to write your story for you. Just because he knows what's going to happen and has ordained your steps and ordered your in the birthing room, and you're not the author with the funeral director. That first number you're not the author of, that last number you're not the author of, but the dash in between, you're the author. So here it is. Let's close this way. In this next slide, what story are you telling about yourself right now? What story are you telling? What story are you telling? Maybe that's a thought question. Maybe that's a question you can put in chat if you want, if you feel so led. What, what, what? What story are you telling about yourself? Is it accurate? Are you telling an accurate story about yourself? When you look in the mirror, do you see yourself accurately? And I'm not just talking about your physiology. Do you see your mind and your soul accurately? Do you see your lovability that you're beloved accurately? Or do you think you got to merit it? You got to earn it. You think you got to earn? Because if you got to earn love and earn acceptance, then God's not omnipotent. The point here is that you're off the hook because God is omnipotent. It's his omnipotence is the prism through which we see ourselves tonight. And that you're the author of your story. And you get to write what you want in your story. You get to explore your perfect self <laughs> that he created your inmost being, that you're fearfully made. God references his creation when he looks at you. 
that you're an extension of the imagination of God and the secrets about who you are. You have beautiful secrets about who you are. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful secrets. His works are wonderful when it comes to you. Your primal self that is undeveloped. You haven't acted on it yet. You haven't walked in your destiny and all that you are. Your prehistoric self. By the way, let me let me close with this. Prehistoric is not just a kind of positive rendering of, I, of, of Psalm 139, 13 through 18. Uh, specifically Psalm 139, 16, and 17. Uh, that's not really, uh, or 16 through 18, rather. But prehistoric means that which predates recorded history. But this is what I'm looking at. And this is where I'll, I'll, I'll land. In some cases, your prehistoric self indicates parts of you that are now outdated and outmoded. There are ways of being that you've been a long time that are outmoded and outdated and that are no longer relevant. God's not doing that part of you anymore. He's not doing it. We got to move beyond that which God mapped out for us and the fact that we've been on his mind and the fact that we're beloved. We got to move beyond just being beloved as a kind of abstract idea in our lives. We got to move beyond the fact that God watches over us and has given us angels charge concerning us. At some point, we got to walk in our perfect selves in a manner that we cast aside the outmoded you know, parts of you. Let me give you an example. I want to be specific, you know, I, and I don't want to get in trouble saying this. There's nothing wrong with being nice. But some of y'all are nice to the point it distorts your personality. God ain't called you to be nice. Lord have mercy. God called you to be kind and loving. God ain't called you to be a doormat. God may have called you to be a bridge in some rooms, to bridge gaps and bring people together. But you ain't no doormat where people wipe their feet on you. There are ways that we've become uh, 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 um, survivors in that are prehistoric that now need to be cast aside. We can't continue to be that way. What is, what is something about you that needs to be left behind? Is it anger? Because anger makes me feel powerful. Anger makes me feel... I'm on top of it. Maybe maybe you're not even a real angry person. What story are you telling on yourself? What, what, what story are you telling about yourself right now? I want you to think about that in the coming week as we wind down this study. Let me give you some uh, homework. Let me give you some homework. Uh, I want you to read Psalm 139, 19 through 24 three times. Just three times. It's not a lot. Just get it in your spirit. And I got this, these two thought questions for you. Is it wrong to hate people when they've done you and others harm? Why or why not? Second thought question. How should hatred be confronted and managed? Those two questions I want, I want us to discuss at the top of next week. Is it wrong to hate people when they've done you and others harm? Why or why not? It's not a trick question. Not a trick question. Um, by the way, there's no wrong answer either. I'm not looking for wrong. I'm looking for authentic answers more than I am right answers. Okay. <laughs> Is it wrong to hate people when they've done you and others harm? Why or why not? How should hatred be confronted and managed? How, how should we confront it? If we feel hatred, what do we do about it? How do we manage it? How do we confront it? You got to confront your hatred if you feel it. And you got to resolve it some kind of way or manage it, right? Okay, so that is your homework. Any questions anybody has? Any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, all right. I went over a few moments, and I thought I'd be a little brief, more brief, but, well, maybe that's why y'all giggle sometimes when I say I'm being more brief. <laughs> yes, uh, Monique. Okay, what's the difference between hatred and anger? Um, I think that uh, hatred is ill will. I think being angry with someone is normal and is normative. I think hatred is extreme disdain and wishing somebody ill. That's malevolence that I don't want you to do well. Or I want to harm you. There's feelings of harm. If I, don't do it, I think sometimes we can hate people humanly and never act on it. 
you know, um, some people do, but I harbor extreme antipathy. So I think it's a difference between being angry. Uh, we can be angry at people we love deeply. In fact, we're usually more angry at people we love, but uh, hating people. Um, oh, by the way, I think we can hate people that we love too. <laughs> I think, you know, there's a, that movie, there's a thin love, thin line between love and hate. Pretty good, funny movie, too. Um, uh, it's true. It's true. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Excellent question. Yes. Anybody else? Any other question? Yeah. You know, we don't care to hate people that we don't know. <laughs> it's the people we know well that we might feel antipathy for antipathy is such a nicer word than hate um but uh it's real sometimes we feel hate yeah uh we probably felt it at some point okay uh okay renee waring you got a question okay renee waring can you unmute I said I had a little trouble following you because you kept cutting in and out. I had trouble following. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. I I don't doubt that I did. I don't doubt that I did. I'm sorry. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Thank you. Any other uh, questions uh, anybody has? Okay. All right. That ends this uh, Bible class. You can uh, fold the presentation. And uh, good to see y'all.